I've fallen into the mistake here of doing something which I hate doing. I called these plate cutters because everybody knows them as plate cutters, type nines. These are the arrows that go through armor. That's what they're for, are they? <laughs> so, who says? Who says? Well, in fact, they struck here, yeah. just above. The head snapped off and then the shaft landed on the eye slit. It was not the head of the arrow penetrating through the helmet that compromised it. Hi, it's Todd from Todd's Workshop here and Toby Capwell. So we're back to talk about Arrows vs Armour 2, which is a film that we made last summer. It was out in the autumn. And it's where we took the trappings of a, a medieval knight from the era of Agincourt, so around about 1415, we took his armour and we shot it. Full weight bow, full weight arrows. If you're not familiar with the films, go watch it. And I say films because we did a main film where we did all the shooting at the night and it was Joe, our archer, did the shooting. And then we did lots of other little spin-off films where we did a deeper dive into different areas, looking at the possible plate materials, the mail, the arrowheads and so on, various other aspects. It's a whole body of work. Go check it out. But this is really to talk about some of the thoughts that we've had about it since then, some of the thoughts that you've had about it since then, and really just to clarify some of the points, because it was a fantastically interesting film for us. But there's an awful lot that you might think that it says that it doesn't. And it's really to have a look at that and then to answer some of your specific questions. So, Toby, really, what is your take on what we did? Yeah, I mean, just to have the chance to reconstruct certain parts of early 15th century armor, you know, the iconic equipment of the Hundred Years' War, and then shoot at it with big bows to see what happens. How do the arrows interact with the armor? How do the really distinctive forms that certain pieces of the armor in this period have, how does that affect the arrows and how does it help protect the wearer through form as well as through the thickness of the metal? And just, just to see it happening, just to see those arrows hitting the metal, sometimes sticking in, glancing off, blowing up, it's all terribly, terribly mm. exciting. And it feels like we're starting to get a window onto the real human experience of fighting in a battle like this. But, you know, in reflecting on that as well and thinking about it and also taking the comments from people, I've started to think, now we have to temper what we said a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, consider what we said. You know, this is not scripted. Yeah. This, the whole point of this is to get everybody together and film honestly what happened. And talk about it. And sometimes our reactions aren't as well considered as they might be. Sometimes language is, is it, you know, gets mixed up in the moment. But now is our chance mm -hmm. to step back and, and identify some things to just be aware of when we're looking at the film again. I'd like to clarify on a point there that Toby's made, made, which is it is unscripted, just in fact like this is now. Yeah. That film was unscripted. And what that means is that we can react very well to what we're seeing. So that's brilliant. But what it also means is that if we choose the wrong word or we stumble it and somebody doesn't pick up on it, suddenly that now becomes part of the film. So that's it happened a couple of times perhaps where we said things that actually in retrospect maybe we made too much of a point of something or we missed other things. I think the first one from my point of view, which I'll then throw back to Toby, is this is not a definitive scientific test. It couldn't be and it was never going to be and that was not the intention of it. This is a complicated situation with arrows that land in different places at different speeds at different angles and the repeatability is never going to be there to say I've shot 30 arrows at this guy and six have gone through and that is the answer. Well next time maybe no one will go through. So you can't say that what happened is factually the end of the story. It's, it's indicative. It is just showing the kind of things that might have happened, and not really any more than that. But also, I know that we kept referring to him as a knight, and actually, on reflection, you felt that was a mistake. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard not to. You know, armor... I mean, look, well, look at him. I mean, yeah. you, know, you can we, see... Yeah, that. that's the thing. It's like the helmet. You take the helmet, it's got two... It's got eyes, it's got nose, mm -hmm. it's got what looks like a mouth, you know you immediately imbue that with identity. Mm -hmm. And then when you set it up on a torso with arms and it stood there holding a spear, we didn't put the spear in to make him look like a soldier. We put the spear in because we thought it might 
have you know some something to play in the way the arrows come in or whatever and what if an arrow hits the spear we wanted to have a weapon there but but then of course as well you take your helmet and when you hit it on the side with the arrow and it flexes and it flexes yeah. back suddenly you're thinking what happens to his neck yeah but actually of course it yeah. was on a piece of armature wire it was not a human neck right I, the armor is not a person you know when people go into museums and you see the armor stood there little kids will say look at the knights well they're not knights they're empty husks that used to contain knights but the armor because it's it's body shaped and because it has so much presence and a sense of identity which it's supposed to have we you know our 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 minds tend to immediately make the leap mm. from human shaped bits of metal to human being mm. and we started referring to him as a knight and you know and, and some of that was lighthearted of course and but I think it's important to step back from that a little bit because, you know, apart from anything else, we didn't have all the pieces of the armor. Mm. He didn't have any gauntlets. He didn't have any leg armor, right? And ultimately, there was no body inside. Mm. So it's not a knight. It's not a human being standing on a battlefield. It is a technical experimental target. Mm. And and it's designed only to test certain things, not the whole possibility of, of a real knight being shot at on the battlefield. Mm. Once you're starting to go down the road of thinking of him as a knight, as a human, again, spontaneously in an unscripted way, it's very easy for us to start, you know, trying to anticipate what injuries he might have suffered. Mm. And we've, and I did it, I did it. I was wrong to start getting excited and say, oh, that would have killed him. Oh, he's gonna bleed to death from that. You know, like the ones in the leg. He gets, you know, he gets shot through the mail, low down on the target. And we think, oh, well that's killed him because it's gone through the armor, but he's got leg armor under there. There's other things going on in reality. You know, the spontaneity and the excitement of it can just lead us to go a little bit too far in the moment. And also, if, if you think that for your purposes and your research interests, our tests might have some value, but they have other weaknesses that you've identified, well, just ignore the bits of the test mm. that you think are irrelevant and take, take from it what you do think is valuable. If you think it should have had a plate skirt, we'll talk about that and we don't, then just ignore the shots below the belt, mm. you know, or whatever. I mean, this is a, this is a malleable thing and we need to, we need to make as much of it as, yeah. as we can, but, but we must be clear about what it is and what it isn't. Yeah. I, I think Toby's just also made a very good point there that my philosophy, our philosophy with this is to tell the tr truth in all ways, always. We don't, uh, we don't try and deceive anybody. We say what we've done and we explain what we've done and we show what we've done. So it's there for you to make your decisions about. And if you don't like some of the decisions we've made, factor that into what you're doing and how you're thinking. But what we have done, we have told you about. So you can see it, if you don't like it, don't use that bit. Don't, don't factor that into your thinking. Think in a different way, do a different test. We wanna see your tests, do them. So the next thing we're gonna do is talk about the armor that we use to do our tests with. Now, there's been a lot of commentary about why we chose the, the pieces that we did and so on. But the first thing to say is that it, it's, it was really carefully made. And not only the materials, it was mild steel. It's a modern material. We get it. But that material, we did one of the spin-off tests. We tested against uh, contemporary materials that would have been around at the time. And actually, it becomes a fairly good analogue for a reasonable quality steel of the period. So that's why we chose the mild steel. Yeah. It was very carefully made, so it is variable thickness, just like the original pieces were. So where the major threats are coming, it tends to be thicker. Where there are lesser threats on the sides, it tends to be thinner. True for the breastplate and the helmet, for sure. The arms, they are what would seem to be a ridiculously 1.2 millimetre thick, which is what, 18 gauge or something in um, gauge thickness, something like that, or maybe even 20 gauge. Really quite thin, 1.2 down to 1 mil on the arms. Seems ridiculous. 
period correct. But the thing is, the other side of that is what were the pieces we chose? Because we didn't have Bessagues, where in fact our test, our test piece suffered quite badly. Got struck a lot there. We didn't have a lower plate skirt, which they may or may not have done. But can you fill us in on that one? Yeah, I mean, the first thing to say about armour in the early 15th century in Western Europe is that this is a time when there's a lot of different new ideas flying around. I mean, plate, the use of metal plate armour had been developing over the course of the 14th century, and it was still evolving in all kinds of ways in the early 15th century. Mm. So, you know, a lot of different kinds of things might very well have been worn in some different configurations. And, um, you know, we've got to choose one to build. So as we were setting out to conceive the armor for the new film, I wanted to build on the comments and the learning that we got out of the first film. In the first film, we were testing only a breastplate, but it was made out of pretty thick medium carbon steel. So it was res representing really a pretty high status piece of equipment mm -hmm. for that time. And we got a lot of comments that said, okay, yeah, fine, the princes and noblemen might have those, but what about everybody else? Mm. Most of the armor that most of the people are wearing at Agincourt is going to be of a lower quality. So we took that on board, and we're thinking now we have a chance to build another breastplate and a helmet and some arm defenses. How can that guide our thinking? So we're thinking, okay, this is someone in the middle, a lower ranking knight or a higher ranking man at arms who's not a knight. Someone who has good armor, but someone who might not have absolutely all the latest, most comprehensive developments in the technology. Yeah. What is the absolute middle of the road, typical armor that we can conceive? That was the goal and the middle of the road armors are going to have more weaknesses than the upper end armors. So we had to build that in and we kind of mm. consciously decided that there were certain things we weren't going to put on. Yeah. You know, the, the, the lack of Bessigues was not us forgetting to put on Bessigues and Bessigues aren't that expensive so it wasn't like it was a financial mm. restriction. Bessigues being that piece of armor there that covers that section. Right, but you know, it is interesting that you know, it, from like the 1420s, a bit later than Agincourt, they become much more ubiquitous mm. on armor in Western Europe in a way that they really hadn't been before. Mm. Uh, and, you know, not to say that, you know, some people had them at Agincourt, absolutely. They're a really good idea, but not everybody. Mm. If you interrogate all of the different visual sources, specifically French and English sources, of the late 14th and very early 15th centuries, Bessigues are harder to find. Mm. You know, they're not unknown, but they are not typical. I mean, what I would say, and this is one of the absolute takeaways I've got from that film, is it absolutely shows why you want to wear them. Absolutely. And, and so you can bet that there were people on that field that day who were looking at their friends, wishing that they had Bessigues too. And but that's a useful thing to have identified. Yeah. yeah. You know, we, you know, as an armor wearer, I know that one of the real dangers when you're getting attacked, if you're getting hit with lances or arrows or sword points or whatever, it hits you in the breastplate, skates one way or the other, and goes between the plates and hits you in the gap in your shoulder. That's a big thing in just the, how armor works and what it can do and what it can't do. But this is something we wanted to show. Mm. There's loads of people where that's not going to be self-evident. Yeah. We want to show that. If we put the Bessigues on, then we just lose that whole issue. And here we can show just how dangerous and just how vulnerable that, area, that is. area is. And you can always look at the test results and then for yourselves, you know, modify it according to what other factors you might want to introduce. This is an example of how that spontaneous in the moment talk and the excitement of it can get inadvertently misleading. You know, when he gets shot through the shoulder, you know, we say, oh, that's killed him. When what we should have said was, yeah, but if he'd had Bessigues, that wouldn't have mm. counted. And, you know, and just, oh. you know, and add, add that stuff in for yourselves. Um, I like but to get excited though, Toby. It is exciting. <laughs> yeah, it is exciting. And the fact is, a lot of people didn't have Bessigues mm. at that time. 
so this is a danger, but you know, we've, we've been able to illustrate that. Okay, talking of illustrating, uh, we have a fantastic opportunity here, and this is not a plug for the book, although it's also a plug for the book. It's not a plug, because <laughs> this one's basically sold out now, anyway. <laughs> oh, but what is important here is that it's got pictures of exactly what we're talking about. So Toby, let's right. um, yeah. just talk through a couple of the pictures here. Okay, first of all, this is a book called Armor of the English Knight. It's not Armor of the French Knight. What I'm doing in my books is looking at the English evidence for what the English were wearing. French equipment is different in certain ways, and it's worn in slightly different ways, but overall, there's a lot of consistency and commonality. We can still use the illustrations in my book because they're convenient and right here, and we can also talk about where you know, French equipment might have differed, but it's, it's, it's really pretty minor. Uh, you know, by, by 1400, you've got, you know, significant plate and mail armor mm -hmm. covering essentially the whole body. And this isn't just for the rich mm -hmm. and powerful. This is for anybody who is a man at arms. That is someone who fights in full armor with the lance on horseback and the sword and the poleaxe on foot, you know, fighting in the manner of a knight. But in essence, this is what you're dealing okay. with. You have a solid plate defense for the body. You've got the bassinet with its, its pointy skull and the pointy visor, usually the male aventail protecting the neck and the throat and the top mm -hmm. of the shoulders, and then articulated mm. plate defenses for the arms and legs. So this area here would be where the Besigues should right. be. So Between, basically roundish plates. They're round, they're oblong, they come in different shapes. It doesn't really matter. The fact is, that although that technology was known, it is not, you know, mm. ubiquitous. It is not absolutely typical. If you go through and look at French and English sources in the first 20 years of the 15th century, they do start to become more common, but the majority of sources don't have them. So there is, the, there is a gap there. You know, they might have been very well aware that that was a weakness in their armor. Uh, but, but new technology takes a while to get traction. Mm. And it's one thing to know about a technology, and it's quite another for it to be all pervasive throughout the military society. I suppose also when your life depends on it, and you've been all right up to this point, you're going to be quite reticent to adopt new things that you're unfamiliar with. If you set up the Besigues right, if you're wearing them correctly, and that's a key point, but mm. if you are wearing them correctly, they they give you a really significant boost in your protection. So you're not really paying for them in a reduction of mobility or a financial burden or anything else. You get a lot of protective benefit for not very mm. much cost. So, you know, it's not really surprising that if you fast forward and you start really mm. getting into the Agincourt period, like 1410 to 15 mm. specifically, those Besigues start yeah. becoming, um, you know, much more common. It's, it's clear they do. But let's go back, let's jump back again now to our plate skirt. So mm -hmm. what were the choices for us not having a plate skirt? Well, plate skirts are, you know, a good idea. And they appear in the 14th century. Uh, they, it's a known technology in 1415. And I'm sure lots of people at Agincourt had them on both sides. But, you know, there are separate elements in this period. L a little later on, the skirts are getting riveted onto the breastplate, so that's that whole thing is one assembly. Yeah. But in this period, the skirts tend to be worn separate. Uh, really? So it literally um, is a skirt in the way that we would think of the skirt. It can be a separate element. Now, you know, there's a lot of variation, and with the, looking at the evidence, sometimes it's hard to tell what's really going on. But plate skirts are there. You know, modern people often make the mistake of thinking at, of your waistline as where your belt is. Yeah, yeah but actually your waistline is just below the ribs. And this is where the waistline of an armor is. And the so-called skirt of, mm. the, of the body armor is protecting you kind of from you know, just below the, the navel, mm. just below the ribs, down to uh, the level of the groin. Mm. Um, but the plate skirts are not entirely ubiquitous in this period either. Um, there's, you know, because you're thinking of these things as different elements, People are choosing to wear their armor in different ways. Right. Oh, right. You know, so you've got the you've got the breastplate, mm. and sometimes with certain kinds of rear defenses as one element, you've got the skirt as another element. Sometimes joined, sometimes not. But equally, 
again, if we're thinking about those people who might be under financial constraints and having to make tough choices about what equipment they're going to wear, you know, wearing the long male shirt with some kind of tough textile defense underneath and then a solid one piece breastplate, sometimes that might be what, you know, you know, all that these people had. And there are illustrations of that in, in French and otherwise Western European art of the period too. So our omission of a plate skirt on the test armor was more down to, you know, money and time than it was some kind of grand, mm. you know, conceptual choice. You know, this is still really expensive stuff that takes a lot of, you know, time, money and effort to put together. And we have to make choices about where our funds are going. But you can also anticipate, you can see, you know, what kind of protection the, the, the different plates are offering. And you can start to get a sense of what a plate skirt would do if you added it in. Mm. And you can go through our data and start crossing off all the pierces of mail that wouldn't have happened if mm. there had been plates there. It's, it's a simple adjustment that viewers yeah. can make for themselves. Yeah, after deciding if they feel that they should or shouldn't. But is it fair to say most guys on, on the field at Agincourt, most French on the field at Agincourt probably had plate skirts, but there would also be many who did not. Would that be a fair statement, as far as we can tell? It's really hard to say. Um, the, the, the hardest leaps to make in, in understanding armor is, is the leap you have to make from the visual and textual sources that you have to the human reality on the field. Mm. You know, from a, a beautifully illustrated, um, you know, French manuscript of the period that shows knights and their armor in what seems to be, you know, clarity and fidelity. How do you know that's what's really being worn out on the field? And also with the written sources, the clerks and, you know, the people writing inventories and things, they're not trying to describe reality for us. How, how do we anticipate how much old, outdated equipment would there be on the battlefield? In 1415, how many guys are wearing gear that was made in 1375? Mm. How expensive uh, you know, and difficult to acquire are those plate skirts mm. beyond a certain point? I mean, this is really difficult stuff we're getting into now because we're trying to approach the human reality. Mm. We are starting to get onto the verge of what our available evidence can tell us. There are no complete armors surviving from this period. We've got fragments and we've got artistic illustrations and textual sources. But, you know, there are some massive hypothetical leaps that still have to be made. And, and it's a guess. When you do something like this, you have to make guesses. Yep. They're informed guesses, I hope, but they may not be the same guesses as some other informed people might make. When we did our test, it was very important that we had as many of the correct elements as we could. The bottom foundation layer was the arming coat. So this has been absolutely beautifully made, carefully made of layers of linen and in some areas wool as well. It's worn under the armour, but some of the armour also hangs off it. But then over that you have the mail here, and then you have the plate armour. It's the plate that you really look at in these tests. But the mail was also really important to it, because a lot of the strikes were going straight through this mail. Now this is a commercially made mail, it's not the beautiful handmade stuff that we used on some of the Aventail and on the standard underneath. But again, one of the deeper dive films we did was we tested handmade mail against commercially available mail and well, we compared the difference and those results are there for you to find. But the arrows were going through this really quite easily. It's interesting because you imagine that this must be relatively resistant. But then you look at the Aventail and that really was resistant. That was, I think a couple of shots went through and I went back later on to shoot again and again. But that fundamentally most of the time, almost all of the time, stopped the arrows. They did not pierce the Aventail. So is there anything that we know that we can learn from things like double mail? Because I know that that's a reference in some of the, the discussions about Agincourt. I'm not really familiar with it beyond yeah. conceptually what it sounds like. It's, it's very hard. I mean, in the documents, in inventories, they usually place the mail as separate from the plate. You can read what they say about the mail defenses in a particular inventory. And sometimes they use terms like double mail, for example, mm. or you know, there, there are a few other terms, but double mail is a common one. 
And you can think, well, I have an idea of what that might be. It's obviously male that's stronger and more you know, heavily built mm. than the typical male. But what does that mean really? Is it double wire thickness or double the amount of links or two you, layers you, of links or do nothing I, exists? I'm sure there's lots of people who have very strong opinions about what that means. But ultimately, you can't connect the text with the surviving objects. But we can, we can say a couple of things as far as might be. Mm. First of all, male is not just one material. Male is, is like metal cloth. And by changing the links that you're using, you can ch change its physical properties really dramatically. Some male can be really light and super flexible, and other male is really stiff and mm. dense and heavy and protective. And often on armor, the weave of the male will be varied depending on what you're doing with it. Yeah. You can't make an entire armor out of the most heavily, densely woven stuff you can make because it won't mm. move and it's too heavy. So you have to, you have to choose where you're going to put mm. the flexibility and take sacrifices in the protection and other places where you've got to have the protection and you're going to sacrifice mm. some mobility. Yeah. So, uh, and then there are a couple of different weaves involved as well, the actual way you put the links mm. together. The, the absolute majority of um, male in the late medieval period is woven on the, the four in one principle, where each link, you look at it, it's got two links above and two links below. But there is such a thing in the late Middle Ages as six in mm. one. Mm. Uh, six in one is exactly what it says. But what that means is that the weave is much, much denser. There's many more links covering the same given surface yep. area, and it's heavy and it's inflexible. But it's great mm. for things like a collar, th and that's exactly what we use yep. on the test subject as a consequence. So, so yeah, so the lower part of the collar is in a four to one, but this band here is in a six to one right. weave. Right. makes it much stiffer and much more protective, as Toby says. But the other thing that I found really interesting, I didn't know until I sent it away for repair, is you can mend four in one because you can get your riveting pliers in. Right. Six in one is really, really difficult or close to impossible to actually mend a, a puncture in it. Uh, it it basically strike. is impossible. Basically impossible, there we go, because yeah. you make mail as well. Yep, I've made six in one mail and you, ha you can't... You, you can't construct it and then go back through and rivet it later mm. because it's so, if it's made properly, it's so densely woven, you can't get tools yeah. in there to close, to yeah. put the rivets in or to close them. So six in one male has to be made from the edge and you have to construct and rivet as you go from the edge. And then once it's made, that's it. I, and one I made for a film recently, I, I was going quite far along in the process and then I realized I'd made a mistake. And there was one link that was o only had five links on it instead uh -huh. of six. There's nothing I could do about it. I can't cut it out and change yeah, it. Yeah. Forget it. So That's it's fun. just, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, so the point is that we can't talk about male as some kind of constant. We can't say arrows defeat male. Mm. Arrows always will go through the male. It's not true. If you give a, male, a good male maker the task of putting some arrow-proof mail on a key part of your armor, he can do it. Mm. He just can't make the entire hauberk out of mm. that. Well, he could, but the problem would be weight. So, so the thing is, something's possible, but it doesn't mean that you want to do it. And it all comes right. all the way back, <laughs> if you like, to the arm armor. Yeah. Because the arm armor was very thin. And, and it, we did puncture it with arrows. You know, we showed that at the end. Uh, and so you can sit there and go, well, that, you know, that's awful. Why would you make armor that thin? You, well, you can make it thicker, but you make it thicker and you can't move your armor around quickly or, or for a long period of time. So suddenly your armor that defends you actually is the armor that helps to defeat you because you can't fight anymore. Right. So it always becomes a compromise with all these sort of things. And mail is another one of these compromises that that might not be great as a general arrow proof armor but it is better than nothing. And what it does do is it defends well against uh, daggers and well against um, swords and other things like there that. There are other threats that you other also threats. have to be taking into account. Yeah. 
you can't just say that arrows will or they will not defeat a piece of mail because this time they might. But if it hits on the belly, maybe it will. If it hits on the chest, maybe it won't. Or the other way around, whether it is flat to the torso or whether there is a little bit of bag to it and so on, whether it's folded up a little bit. The same mail, the same arrow, the same energy, same distance. Sometimes it will go through, sometimes it won't because the way the material itself is struck. And even, you know, it could be whether it hits two links or one link, because both things are possible with an arrow. And let's just remind ourselves of one of the very few but significant things that the eyewitness accounts of the Battle of Agincourt actually say specifically about armor. Maddeningly, the vast majority of historical accounts of these battles and things they just aren't bothered most of the time with saying anything specific about armor. A lot of that they just take for granted and they tell you what happened and they don't tell us things that we want to know, right? But there's an account of the Battle of Agincourt where they say um, that, that the French knights chose to wear long male shirts. The way it's worded, you can't be sure, but it seems pretty clear to me anyway that what they're saying is of all the ways you can wear the, the armor, the plates and everything of this period, you can wear it with the full male shirt underneath, or you can just wear it with a skirt and sleeves if you're, mm. if you're going for a lighter configuration. But the eyewitnesses say they wore those full male shirts under their plate armor. So that says that they something. thought it was useful. Mm. They thought it was worth the physical cost of wearing it. Mm. And and they, they seem to think that that was really necessary. It's a second line of defense. You know, the plate armor is good protection, but it, you know, in this case, the physical cost is worth having something underneath. Mm. And the mail to them is still quite important. So there's a couple more aspects that I'd like to talk about. And the first of those is the distance that we did the test over. Now it's 15 meters, that's evidently very short. And I would warrant shorter than almost any fighting was ever done between a, a knight and an archer. However, we needed to be able to hit the target reasonably reliably. That means that we can't do it out at 50 meters or 80 meters, uh, whatever flat shooting might be, you know, close up shooting might be. And it probably came a lot closer than that, I suspect. But to get the accuracy, we need to come close. So we went to 15 meters. We did, of course, try to give you the information that allows you to think about what it really means. So we shot the distance in another one of the deeper dive films with Joe, looking at the speeds that we got and the energies. So all of that is there for you to know about. But the 15 meter test, yes, the energy drops off, but actually it's not that much by the time you get out to 60, 70 meters. It was losing maybe about 20, 25 joules, I think. But it does mean that the 15 meter test is not invalid against the plate. It couldn't get through. So it's not gonna get through at 50 meters or 80. It was getting through the mail and it would likely get through at 50 or 80 meters still through the mail out there. So it worked well for that and it allowed the accuracy that we wanted. So the next thing I'd like to talk about are the arrows themselves, the arrowheads, because I've fallen into the mistake here of doing something which I hate doing, which is quoting something as fact when I don't know where that fact comes from. <laughs> right. And I called these plate cutters because everybody knows them as plate cutters, type nines. These are the arrows that go through armor. That's what they're for. Are they? <laughs> so, who says? Who says? Where, where is that video from 1415 right. showing us of these things doing that? So I am guilty for that and I will put my hand up. However, if you ask me as an engineer what sort of arrow is likely to go through armour best, I'm going to say something along these lines. It's a bit like a cold chisel head. You know, it, it's, it's got four cutting faces which do seem to go better through metal than trying to push and, and, and part the metal. You know, it's actually cutting the metal. My gut feeling is that is the kind of arrowhead that they would have been shooting at armour. So we made a choice and we shoot this. It was in wrought iron because we know that there are lots of heads out there which are wrought iron. We find them all the time. They're, the museums are full of them. We also made the mistake of saying there are no steel arrowheads of this type. So the fact that there is a steel one out there was highlighted to me by a guy called Diego Braga. There's a note to his channel in the links. Thank you very much for that. And it was a great discussion between himself and Will and myself and some other people about 
this type of arrowhead. Now it's turned out that there is at least one in evidence that is of a really high grade steel, really carefully and thoughtfully made. It wasn't just accidentally done to be steel. But what is really important here is it made no difference to our testing whether they were case hardened, whether they were um, wrought iron. The bottom line is there was an impact difference, there was definitely an impact difference, but the bottom line is the arrows did not go through the armour. So that's what I mean by it made no difference, ultimately. It still didn't defeat the armour. But you also find another military head which has steel in it, which is this, Type 16. The Type 16 is a military head as well, and those we do find with steel in them. Now Matt Easton, linked to his channel in the, in the notes, also put together a fantastic film looking at all of the legislation to do with this. Because they didn't, when the king or the armories wanted arrows, they didn't just ask for arrows, they gave a specification, even back in 1360. And they said exactly what they wanted. And what they wanted was steel arrowheads, quite specific, steel or steeled arrowheads. They wanted them. They passed a law to get them. And there was a punishment. And the more time that goes by, the more laws are passed. Matt's film's fantastic for this. And you get to the Tudor period, the, the 16th century, and now they are really strict about it. You have a confis uh, confiscation of goods, you get massive fines, you get imprisonment if your arrows are substandard. They knew they wanted steel arrows, they wanted them, they asked for them. Did they get them? Well, they also asked for arrows which were marked by the maker. Every single one was stamped. I've never seen those. So that's something that I know is not out there, at least not in quantity. The steel ones would have to cut up and analyse lots of arrowheads to really find out. But certainly the norm is in wrought iron, so that's why we chose that. It leaves an intriguing possibility though, because some of the laws that Matt was looking at specified that crossbow heads did not need to be of steel. Crossbow heads, uh, again, they're this kind of diamond section, type 9 type shape. They have a big socket, 12 mil, half inch socket, suits a war arrow, arrow shaft very well. And maybe we're getting a little bit mixed up in the historical record between what's a crossbow head that is not steel and a longbow head which should be steel. Are we going to get to the bottom of it? I don't know, but there's a lot more research to look in that area. Maybe, actually, because these heads aren't going through the armour anyway, they're shooting these steel barbed ones. So we should perhaps go back and do a bit more testing with that. It'd be nice to see what those actually do. Let's shoot some of those and mm. see if the quite noticeable difference in the design of the head mm. has a corresponding difference in effect. Because mm. that's another key point. You can point out what might be wrong here or what might be wrong there, but you also have to consider whether it actually matters at all. Mm. Some of these things, you change the specification, you think what we did before might not have been quite right, there's no appreciable difference in the human reality mm. of the experience. And you know, let's remember again that the medieval people working with this technology did not have an established universal scientific method. And they didn't know what was going on at the microcrystalline level. And they couldn't explain the chemistry involved in any of this. Their technology and their world is about pure empirical skill mm. and observation in practice and you know that gets you a long way and clearly they you know they were evolving their technologies very rapidly despite all of that but there's a lot of misconception and and you know erroneous assumption that's going to fall into that and they could have thought that the steel really mattered mm. when it actually doesn't yeah that's a, that's a very good point actually it could be exactly that, that they asked for the steel because it's harder, therefore it must be better, but actually ultimately made no difference at all. I mean, they used to do the same with gunpowder, that they would put different chemicals into the gunpowder that created more smoke and more flash, because more smoke and more flash must be more powerful. Did nothing at all. If anything, it might have watered it down and made it worse, but the perception was that it was better. I do think my gut feeling still stands that the case hardened, the steel ones, where the strikes are marginal, like for instance on an arm, which now it might penetrate through where it didn't before and so on. But you know, it's gonna be a limited number of shots where that is really gonna be important. Right, and at the end, just to bring it back to the armor that's taken a hell of a pummeling in all of this, you know, it's, it will not make you invulnerable. Nobody ever claimed that mm. it does. All it has to do 
is be good enough to make it worth wearing. And, you know, that's, that's clear. You can step back from all of the, the very close technical arguments of this point and that point, step back a bit and remember that armor was still worn, you know, for hundreds of years until the mid 17th mm -hmm. century, you know, on the, on the macro level, there's clearly a very good reason for wearing it, regardless of what your opponents are shooting at you. Tell you one thing that we did forget to mention, actually, is something which is amazing irony in the end of all of this. Was we set out, one of our principal ideas at the beginning here, was to see if the sights and the breaths of the helmet could be pierced. Right, right. And actually, we came very close with the strike here. Mm -hmm and this one here, but again, they did not go through. These two, yeah. they did not ultimately go through. Yeah, my, my starting point with that question was, um, you know, again, the, you know, the, uh, there's this eyewitness comment about being worried about the sights and the sides mm -hmm. of the helmets being vulnerable. I interpreted the sides, vul the vulnerability of the sides, meaning, yeah, the metal might be a bit thinner on the sides, mm -hmm. but you've also got the breaths. Do the breaths enhance the arrow's uh, potential purchase because mm. gaining purchase and not just slipping off is one of the, the mm. big components of this whole process and do these do the holes provide the purchase and what happens when they do well as it turns out not a lot mm. it's not the, the the punching holes in your visor doesn't really cause you it doesn't major problems as far as we can tell having shot this thing 30 times or whatever and i it did was. give it quite a pounding to the face and then you did shoot more later yes but the supreme irony of the whole thing is it actually actually did not get defeated by a penetration it was in that fantastic shot it struck well in fact it struck here yeah. just above the head snapped off and then the shaft landed on the eye slit and, and some went under some went and the core of the shaft extruded through and into basically around the area where his eye would have been. It was not the head of the arrow penetrating through the helmet that compromised it. It was actually the shaft itself. It was a giant splinter that did for it. But I think that illustrates something really interesting, which is that you can, you can anticipate a threat and you can design protection to deal mm. with that threat. But in all of these kinds of combat, in any warfare, in any combat, there is that that blurry area of weirdness mm. that the the possibility for weird random things to cause trouble and you can't design an armor you know to protect against that bit of a splinter that mm. gets lucky and goes through your yeah. brain you just can't that's where that's part of why total invulnerability is just never never going to be achievable no but again it was an interesting thing here that I hadn't accounted for is the very limited visibility that you've already got with a strike here and then a further strike here it closed up the vision in that eye slot massively so he's already lost half of his effective vision uh, and then you get the splinter through and it's going to be causing trouble onto the other side as well and so you know without falling too far into that mistake of, of saying there's a guy inside but those two things are definitely going to be problematic and that was something I just hadn't considered. Well on a, there are I mean there are a number of things going on here where as well as the primary effect of an arrow there are all kinds yeah. of secondary effects and those secondary effects on the mass scale could really add up. I mean that we've only just touched on how mm. those secondary effects can come into play because again the data set in the in, is still relatively small here, yeah. but it just gives you a little bit of a taste. And if you expanded this into hundreds of shots with scores of bowmen shooting at loads of these targets, mm. you'd start to see the, a lot of those secondary effects really starting to add up to something yeah. serious. That you know, We started out on day one of the Arrows versus Armor project years and years ago saying this is not as simple as can one arrow go through one mm. breastplate mm. and I, th I think you know the progress of the project has 
has led to an appreciation of all of that complexity and randomness and weirdness and primary versus secondary effects. It's all of that in play. It's not a simple thing. Reality is complicated. All right? Reality is complicated. It is complicated it? and hard to understand. But, yeah. but I think this has taken us a little way further to that. It's not answered every question. It's not solved all the problems of it. But it's given us directions to look in. It's given us things to think about. And it has, yeah, it's highlighted. I mean, that was, again, a point I hadn't considered, actually, is the randomness of an impact like that, in the sense of you can design it to defeat this, this, and this, and this, and then something weird happens. And if you, if you design it to defeat that, then maybe it opens the door for some other weirdness to happen. You know, it's, That's why it's, the evolution keeps going. Yeah. The, the evolution, the new pressures come in every time a, a new form develops, and, and the evolution continues. That's everything, really, that I've wanted to cover today, just looking at different aspects of that film. But there is, of course, the burning question, is there going to be an Arrows vs. Armour 3? And... I could tell you this has used me up badly on this one. So right now, today, there isn't. But if there was going to be an Arrows vs. Armour 3, Toby, what would you be doing? Well, my gut feeling is that uh, another film should go really beyond Agincourt now. I mean, that was a subject that was beaten well to death long before we ever got to it. And then we've done two very intensive main films and a whole lot of other secondary supporting films just on that one battle, on that, on that one moment, that one fighting context. And, you know, I think we need to step back if we're going to do more and look at war archery in the late Middle Ages more expansively. Mm. Look at you know, different moments in history at different periods or different battles being fought by different people in different situations. I mean, the Battle of Agincourt in lots of ways was really atypical and strange and unusual. And that's one of the reasons why it's stuck so much in everyone's imagination. But, you know, let's look at the later 15th century or let's look earlier at what was going on before mm. or, or just... If Agincourt isn't a typical engagement and it isn't the usual way that, that archers fight, what is? And yeah. what are the other issues and other contexts that they're having to deal with and, and make different choices in? There's, there's a lot more beyond that just that pure question that we've pursued that now, I think, mm. as far as we need to go. I think we've gone as far as we need to go. I'll, <laughs> say, I'll take that one. So, Toby, All right, thanks, thank sir. you very much. Okay. And once again, for all the backers that actually made Arrows vs. Armour 2 possible, thank you. Because, well, it's kept me busy for a year, something <laughs> like that. Um, but it's been brilliant. Loads and loads of films, as Toby says. I think there's, like, between one and two, Arrows vs. Armour 1 and 2, something like 15 or 18 different films. Go check them out. They've all got bits of information about different specific areas. If you like this kind of stuff, you'll be all over that. Thank you.